Thank you very much. Um, first of all, thank you very much, Norman, for a wonderful friendship, which we have had now for around 10 years, uh, which has opened my eyes in many, many respects on a human level, about the human condition, about literature, art, history, my own native country, Romania, about politics, uh, and many, many, uh, many, many other topics. It also about philosophy itself, which is the humanistic discipline which I care most about. <coughs> uh, thank you also to Cella for a wonderful friendship. Thank you also for the Romanian Cultural Institute for having brought me here and for having prevented me from being deported uh, to an US immigration detention center because my pas German passport was not entirely in order. Thank you very much for this invitation. <laughs> um, secondly, while I am also very much enchanted by Norman Mana's sense of humor, my talk itself will not contain any jokes. But if you bear with me, there will be at least a punchline. <laughs> and finally, my talk is not directly just about Norman, but about his relation to Paul Celan. Nevertheless, I hope you will understand that every line written in this speech is owed to what I have learned from Norman and what I still have to learn. Norman Mana has written about many writers and poets. One poet particularly close to his heart is Paul Celan, the survivor of an unspeakable nightmare, the poet of the survival and nightmare. Survival and nightmare two themes of great importance to Norman Mana's own literary work. In a recent essay, Mana has located the source of Celan's lyrical power in his, I quote, intransitive language, the codified and often hermetic expression of the solitude that survives and germinates in the inner life of the aftermath, unquote. Mana describes Celan's poetry as a last and desperate attempt to give life and expression to the mute and burnt specter of nightmare itself. Celan's own, writing address, own, own writings address the question of survival of language's ability to bear out the nightmare and resurface in the wake of disaster. In a speech in 1958, Zelan described the recovery of language as involving a process of simultaneous enrichment and loss, at once gain and deprivation. Zelan quote, I have a handout, so some of the, my quotations will be on a handout if you'll find the handout. Zelan wrote, quote, language has remained unlost, yes, in spite of everything, but it had to pass through its own lack of answers, pass through the terrible silencing, journey through the thousands of dark, death-bringing words. But it passed, passed nevertheless through these happenings, it passed through and was able to re-emerge enriched, ungereichert by it all." End of quote. In both Celan and Mana, we encounter the theme of the nightmare-possessed survival of language language in the aftermath of a murderous nightmare, of course the Holocaust, but not only in, in uh, Norman's uh, case, in Norman's case also the Gulag. But how is, how is this broad overlap manifested in each individual poet? What similarities, what differences are there between them? How is the nightmare actually expressed? And how is it overcome, if it is overcome? I start with Celan. I choose two examples from the poet's early work and from his late period. First, the early work. In the poem entitled Near Nearness of Graves, which is on the handout, written in 1944, as Celan emerged from the Second World War in which the Nazis had killed his mother, we read the first two lines, still do the southerly book waters know, mother, the wave whose blows wounded you so, and the last two lines, and can you bear mother as once on a time the gentle, the German, the pain-laden rhyme? This poem is written in a traditional style representing idyllic nature scenes with watermills, aspens, willows, 
Scenes so present to the classical and romantic German poetry, with much used words like schmerzlich, pain laden, and above all, the, ad the adjective leise, gentle, so often used by the romantics, especially, for instance, by Josef von Eichendorf, who in his poem, Die Nachtblume of 1837, combined it with Wellenschlagen, which is the softly beating waves of the romantic imagination. But these very waves mutate in Celan into outright blows, tearing into his mother's flesh. The language of German poetry is still intact in this poem. Romantic melancholy is still present. Yet the way in which Celan draws upon the predictable romantic images no longer belongs to Eichendorff's poetic universe. Having broken loose, the wound inflicting waves are no longer permitted to be gentle, lissom. The last stanza, in fact, overcomes romanticism altogether. The poet stoops, reflects on German itself, his own language, murmuring the tradition to himself, taking hold of its roots in the past, the past to which his German-speaking Jewish mother belonged, a mother who had made efforts to maintain German as the language of the family, the language at home in a Jewish family. This past has now become unbearable, tells us the poem. Unbearable not for the mother, who is already dead, but for the son, who writes in this language, about this language, against this language. Turning to the work of Norman Manner, a parallel might be in the way in which the language of classical Romanian literature finds its muffled echo in Manner's prose, a prose in which the motifs of the nightmare are also interwoven. Why not investigate, for example, where and how Jon Kranger, the greatest author of romantic Romanian folk tales, reappears in Manner's work? Manner read Kranger immediately after his return from the concentration camp in Transnistria. This early reading of Kranger, Manner has described as, I quote, a magical encounter an immersion into the wonder of language. I think, he tells us, it was a moment that was decisive for, for everything that subsequently held me bound to reading and writing." End of quote. As far as I know, no critic has given us yet an interpretation of how this magical encounter with a traditional Romanian author has affected Manas' work and language, and how the romantic beauty of Kranger's folkloric prose has resurfaced or survived in Manas' nightmare-possessed prose. And how, more generally, the language of the great Romanian writers, Eminescu, Caragiale, Rebranu, Kojbuk, etc., has resurfaced in the prose of an author who very often has told us that he was formed and deformed in the Romanian language. Maybe the analogy with Celan's nearness of graves might prove fruitful. To search for another parallel between Celan and Manea, I turn to Celan's later poetry, whereas in Nearness of Graves, the nightmare is reflected through the language of classical German poetry. In time, in Celan, we notice a certain radicalization. For example, in his late poem, Tübingen, January, written in 61. Here, we have again a reference to classical German poetry, even a quotation the famous line from Hölderlin's hymn, The Rhine, from 1801, a riddle, is pure, sorry, a riddle is what is purely a reason, which continues with, even the song may scarcely unveil it. Ein Rätsel ist rein entsprungenes, auch der Gesang darf es kaum enthüllen. But in Hölderlin's mystery, sorry, but Hölderlin's mystery, born in purity, appears in Celan as an almost ironical quotation. For what mystery and purity can there be given that Celan's poem was written in January, the month in which the Wannsee Conference took place in 1942 in Berlin, the beginning of a nightmare of which Celan knew all too much. For Celan, the passage from Hölderlin is only a quotation, an old reflex, like the memory of Hölderlin's towers. If a real man were to come to us, an old, a biblical patriarch with a shining beard, 
and judge our times, he would reveal to us nothing of Helderlin's pure and holy sacred mystery. Rather, this man, the, this prophet, would merely babble, ramble, ever, ever, more, more, is written on the poem on the handout. And as a proof, Zelan quotes Helderlin again, namely the meaningless word palaksh, 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 which Helderlin often used after he had lost his mind. We can no longer intuit here any trace of the ineffable sublime, but are left with the inexpressible of a poor madman, banal, flat nonsense, after the world has been burned and devastated, similar to the wastelands to be found in Samuel Beckett's place. Norman Manner has intuited Celan's expression of the nightmare very precisely in a recent essay. I quote, it's on the handle, it is a case of silencing of a language not only corrupted by the real, but also wholly burned by the pitch darkness of the real. The silenced souls of the burnt ones haunt the morbid void through which the poet travels." Unquote. Remarkably, the same self-annihilating aspect of poetic language can also be found in Mana's own literary work. There are numerous examples of which of ways in which this radicalization occurs. Whereas in the collection of short stories, October 8 o'clock, the nightmare is still articulated, although at a masterly level, using relatively conventional literary methods. In the Lair, Visuina, his most recent novel, Norman adopts a more fragmented and syncopatic style. The characters are stranded right now in absurdity after the demolition of a world in which the epic made sense, had made sense, but doesn't make any sense anymore. Ovidiu Pechican, a Romanian critic, writes about this novel, I quote, it's also on the handout, the individual's confrontation with totalitarianism, the high lightning of human fragility in the face of terror, all collapse into absurdity. The illusion of tragic grandeur expires in the trash bin. The novel, The Lair, is a farce." Unquote. So in both authors, we find a tendency towards the farcical for similar reasons. But there are also differences. Whereas in Celan, the tendency towards the farce is a late phenomenon, in Mana, it can be detected much earlier, as is proven by his third novel, The Apprenticeship Years of August the Fool from 1979. I don't think it's translated into English, so maybe it should be. A more significant difference is Mana's more pronounced insistence on irony and burlesque, which you will not find so much in, in uh, Celan, which makes Mana not only a writer of the total nightmare, but also a writer of the call to, I quote, resistance and rebirth, without which neither life nor art would be possible, unquote. He wrote this very recently. In Celan, by contrast, the nightmare appears more somber and inescapable, and this affects his poetic conception in a much more dramatic way. As Celan wrote in, hi in his speech, The Meridian, from 1960, I quote on the handout, the poem today proves a powerful tendency towards silence. It affirms, maintains itself at the very edge of itself. It constantly calls itself in order to preserve itself from its non-existence, schon nicht mehr, back into its still hanging on, immer noch, unquote. And in another passage, originally composed for the Meridian, but only published posthumously, we read, the darkness of the poem is the darkness of death. The humans are the mortals. For this reason, the poem is the most hum humane in us humans. For the poem is what commemorates, recalls our mortality." Unquote. So poetry, as a memory of death, but also a memory of murder, <coughs> belongs to the most human aspect of the human. This was Celan's vision of poetry and poetry's role in expressing the nightmare. This vision of poetry, I believe, is continued in Norman Manner, but maybe in a different way, maybe even rewritten in his own way. For Manner argues that, I quote, suffering does not necessarily come to a closure in its black purity in death. 
but rather through an impure continuation and compensation, life itself, unquote. Clearly not a line we will find in Ceylon. Nevertheless, in Ceylon's The Meridian, we find yet another answer which draws the two Bukovinian writers closer to each other. Ceylon explains to us that the poem is solitary, but it is also underway, unterwex, on its way towards the other, the, the, the you as it were, the other who seeks the poem, who is waiting for the poem, through whom it situates itself in the mystery of the encounter, the mystery of the encounter. Already in 1958, Celan had written, quote on the handout, given that poetry is a form of language, and for that reason, dialogical in its essence, it can be a message in the bottle, a bottle cast away in the not always hopeful faith that it will reach a shore, perhaps a short of the heart, Herzland, unquote. I find the same dialogical motive in Norman Mana's work, I find it even in his recent essay, Beyond the Mountains, one of his saddest and most somber texts, a lament for two dead poets, one murdered, guest, the other a suicide, Benjamin Fondane and Paul Celan. It is a text about the fate of the Jews in the last century and ultimately about man's final destiny, death. In this essay, Mana glosses on Celan's own prose text, Conversation in the Mountains, in which two Jews, Klein and Gross, meet each other, or perhaps only their posthumous shadows meet. Mana speaks a, spins a dialogue between the two poet Jews, transforming Klein into Celan and Gross into Fondane. Mana writes, quote on the handout, Having perished in the flames and waters of catastrophe, respectively, the two poets meet only through martyrdom, a martyrdom very different in each case, but nevertheless shared, and through the posthumous dialogue between the lyrical I of each, the much yearned for encounter with the kindred spirit so dissimilar to you. This meeting between two ghosts seems to be invoked out of an elementary need for dialogue, which Mana shares with Celan, and which is not directly only at the living, but also at the dead, the slain, perhaps at them above all. I just quoted Norman. In his poem, Sprich auch du, Speak you also, 1955, Celan writes, Wahr spricht, wer Schatten spricht, which John Felstiner translates as speaks true who speaks shadow, speaks true who speaks shadow. But Mana translates the line as speaks the truth who gives voice to the shadow, speaks the truth who gives voice to the shadow, which places the emphasis on breathing life into the shadow whereas Celan's original is more ambiguous and darker. So in Mana's work, the dialogue between the ghosts still remains a symbol of life, which stands in some contrast to Celan's more moribund, funereal tendency. Mana goes on, quote on the handout, essential as it is, the calling of the other, the invocation of the other party who is on the other side, is its very own justification. The ghostly Celan speaks to the ghost of Fondane, who is beside him, living." Unquote. Notice here again the stress on life, on the living, in Norman. Nevertheless, despite this uh, great contrast between the two writers, I do believe we have a fundamental point in common to both of them, and that is the mystery of the encounter, which I mentioned before. Through the way in which the human, the frail and finite being, remains protected in the mystery of the encounter, and through it, in poetry and in literature, we fathom an answer to the problem of expressing the nightmare. An old-fashioned word for the mystery of the encounter is, of course, love. Rainer Maria Rilke wrote in 1903, I quote, the artist's task is to love the mystery, the riddle, 
This is all art, love which has spread itself over mysteries. And these are all works of art, mysteries surrounded by, ornated with, overcome by love. End of quote. Ultimately, Celan's love mystery was his mother, murdered by the Nazis. We have yet to reflect and understand what Norman Manas' love mystery is in his art. <laughs>